All right, welcome everyone. My name is Jordan Genso. I am running for state senate here in the 22nd district and I had put out an invitation uh, to the general public that I would like to start being able to sit down and have conversations with constituents in, in this district from across the political spectrum because I believe that having these conversations is the first step in trying to create a better political atmosphere uh, for us all and I was super excited to see that um, I've already had somebody reach out and indicate uh, that they were willing to participate in this. And so um, we have never met before, but yeah, I'm Jordan. David. David, nice to meet you. And yes, where do you live? Williamston. Williamston. And so that is in the district? or It's technically like right on the edge, because I know you go right up to Weberville, yes. and then you go a little bit beyond it. Yes. So I'm not sure if like okay. where Which, exactly. Okay. I'm like but, right on the border, though. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to, you know, we're going to have a conversation. I'm going to assume you're a constituent, but even if not, we still are both Michiganders, you know, yep. and we're discussing the state itself and the state government and what we would like to see, um, especially, you know, this conversation came about uh, in response to the recent um, Supreme Court ruling uh, that overturned Roe versus Wade. Um, and so would you want to start by just, you know, asking me questions as a candidate for state senate do you want me to ask you questions how would you prefer to proceed oh uh, well i guess we could start by stating our positions how we actually came to this head yeah if you will um and uh i mean you're the one running so i'm gonna let you start okay so my approach on this issue of pro-choice versus the pro-life side is that pregnancy is one of those things that I just think is such a personal issue where so many things can occur during the process and even beforehand that create a nuanced situation where a one size fit all government policy is likely to result in really horrible consequences mm -hmm. for a lot of these women that I just, when these situations arise, they are so difficult and they're already devastating to the women that to have the government then also play a role and tell them what they have to do with their body at that point, I can never get behind our government doing that. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that my general position is that it's up to the woman and her doctor mm -hmm. to decide what is best for her specific situation. Okay. And so the constraints, because that's where there's always, you know, go to either extreme. What does that mean for my side? Mm -hmm. If you have a late third trimester abortion, the reason why I can view that as within the realm of possible outcomes is because that situation that leads to that is the woman having a situation arise during her pregnancy that she goes to a doctor mm -hmm. and the doctor helps her realize, okay, there is a multitude of bad outcomes that can occur. A medical necessity. A me medical necessity. It, her life may not in that moment be in imminent danger, mm -hmm. but there is a likelihood that it would turn into that, or even if she were to make it full term, the, the fetus itself is not going to ever be a happy, healthy baby that gets to live outside the hospital. It mm -hmm. may be able to be born, but with such complications that it's not a viable pregnancy, really. And so those abortions, those late-term abortions are devastating to think about. And, and your mind immediately goes to, okay, well, what about you know, the woman who's eight and a half months pregnant, perfectly healthy, mm -hmm. you know, pregnancy, no problems whatsoever. I prefer a system where the safeguards are on the doctor side. Mm. That that woman with a perfectly healthy pregnancy, no issues whatsoever, she's not going to find a doctor who's willing to do a procedure that would you know violate their own conscious and Hippocratic oath. And if there was a doctor that would do so, then I would leave it up to the American Medical Association or a group of experts to take the doctor's license mm -hmm. away so that is the consequences and the repercussions for an atrocious abortion that has no justification whatsoever. Like that's where I think the guardrails 
are better served because it's those in the medical community who best understand all of the things that can arise during pregnancy, mm -hmm. they can be the ones then to decide, okay, this is where a doctor will have stepped outside the bounds and violated their oath and therefore there needs to be consequences. They should not be allowed to practice medicine ever again. Mm -hmm. And that system is basically what we have had under the Roe vs. Wade era. And I thought, yes, that is working as it should. The, mm -hmm. the late term abortions do occur because of medical necessity mm -hmm. and, and pregnancies that are not for you know happy, healthy, viable babies. But you don't get the egregious, like there's no actual justification for it or any of that when it comes to the late term stuff. Right. And and so that's my my take on it, going to the extreme and how I can be okay with that is that mm -hmm. I do see safeguards still existing when we had Roe versus Wade in effect. Okay. So I, I just want to make sure I understand your position correctly. Yes. So I don't want to yeah. misrepresent you in any way. You are for a medical necessity uh, need of abortion. When it comes to the late term, to, yes. So only late term. So early term, no? I, before a fetus is viable, mm -hmm. I it's a woman's body. And I mean, okay. it, it is part of her body. Okay. It is not its own entity gotcha. that is a viable... So when do you draw that? At the, the, the third trimester? Like what? Uh, the, not what the role you would be that way, because that was only first trimester yeah. limitation. I, I think it was 20 weeks or 24 weeks thereabouts oh, um, is where it's been considered yeah. viable. Um, and so, so yeah, so after that mark of viability, okay, it's if there is a situation that the woman and the doctor are viewing a, a potential problem that mm -hmm. is going to arise, that is, yeah, that it then should be, there should be privacy at that point. Yeah. Then it should be only, only medical necessity at that point. Because but, the baby's still viable after 20, or we'll just say 21 weeks. Yeah. The baby's viable at that point. Mm -hmm. So unless medically necessary, so if something arises, mm -hmm. um, or the baby seems like the quality of life, not necessarily medical necessary to save mom or save baby, but quality of life just won't be there for the baby then at that point, you would be okay for abortions. But in all other situations, we'll say, mom regret, regrets it at 30 weeks. Yeah. You would say no. I think that the medical establishment, the medical community mm -hmm. should be able to then, at that point, make the determination, would a doctor be violating their Hippocratic Oath if they were to perform that abortion? And, okay. and I don't want to as a lay person, just pretend that my opinion mm. should supplant the experts who, who that is their That's role. their job. Yeah, they, I mean, I'm not a medical expert and I don't want to pretend to be. Yeah. As on, so on the policy side, all I know is I don't want the government mm. where it's individuals like myself that we aren't the experts. Mm. We should, our opinion should not be what is in control in that situation. It okay. should be the medical community and the, the pregnant woman. Okay. Unfortunately, the medical community doesn't set the laws. Mm, right. You would, in your position. Um, you would set the laws, whether it be at the federal level yep. or at a state level. Yes. The overturning of Roe v. Wade to me, and, and actually let me make my point of, uh, I am against abortion personally. Mm -hmm. um, I have weighed the decision as a single father of three girls. Mm -hmm. I've weighed that heavily when my ex was pregnant with them. Um, and I just could not bring myself to end them because there was no medical necessity. We did have some complications and, you know, I don't think it's anything outside of the normal as far as what I would consider a medical complication. Right. Nothing extreme. Right. Um, but to me, just, it, it's my responsibility. I helped in the creation of that life. My responsibility should then be to take care of that life. I know the consequences of what sex can do. Mm -hmm. Do we use birth control? Yeah. She was on birth control. I used condoms. You know, we did all that. Still happened. 99% effective, not 100. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. But me, myself, I could, and it's not religious. I wouldn't say I'm 
heavily religious. In fact, I'd say I'm almost borderline atheist. Um, so religion to me plays no role in that. It's more of a ethics position. Yeah. You know, if I'm going to do some action, I know there is going to be a consequence or reaction to that. And the way I was raised was, if you're going to do something, you better follow through with it. So uh, I, I think accountability really has kind of been lost in a lot of situations here in the U.S. And, and not just this, and it's not on women, it's not on just men, it's on everybody. And as a society, we have lost the ability to take accountability for our actions. Right. It seems like we're always blaming somebody else. Now, in regards to uh, Roe v. Wade, um, I don't see how taking it, because you said you should not be the one to decide. It should be the, on the medical profession. Yes. Changing Roe v. Wade has not changed that. Roe v. Wade was decided by non-medical professionals. Mm -hmm. And so... I think overturning it hasn't changed that perspective at all. Only now it's coming down to more localized, which I think is more powerful for us as citizens. Because now we as citizens have that power to go, hey, Mr. Senator, we don't want that. Mm -hmm. Or yeah, we do want that, but here's some exceptions. Um, and I think that is more powerful than having, you know, trying to get Congress or the Senate to change something now, like you said, the political division is outrageous in this country. Yeah. And it's left versus right, mm -hmm. them versus us. You don't, don't find that as much on a state level. And I think we could come to more agreeable solutions at a state level than we ever could at a federal level. But the federal level status quo of Roe v. Wade, mm -hmm was that it's not for the politicians to really meddle in. It should be left up to the experts. And yes, that is non-experts creating that system of the medical community being the ones mm -hmm. who, who make the judgment call there if there's a doctor willing to perform it or not. Mm -hmm. um, but so the idea that, yes, that was non-experts, but they were saying it shouldn't be the role of government, the default should be freedom. Mm -hmm. In in this situation, like we it's a woman and her bodily autonomy. Mm -hmm. I mean that the default should be that it's her medical because pregnancy is a medical situation. I mean and yes. a woman who goes through child labor in birth mm -hmm. is forever altered by it. Yeah. And so that is very much about the woman's body, regardless of anything else about the viability of the of the fetus it's still no matter what the woman's body and mm -hmm. she's going to have consequences on her body and she sh so the default should be that she should have the freedom exactly. to choose if she wants to accept those consequences or not because it's something obviously you and I it's never anything we're going to experience personally right well be careful you say that too because men can get pregnant now yes so but for the simple fact that, yeah, I mean, we're two guys discussing, you know, what women should be, or how women should be able to control their body and what situations mm -hmm. they should and shouldn't. It really, the default should be the freedom right. side. And to have it be where at each state level, you know, the states are deciding, then you get into a whole different philosophical debate about why? What is it that in this state abortion would be considered murder, mm -hmm. but in this state it wouldn't be? Because then you get in, okay, if Alabama wanted to say, you know, it's not murder if one spouse kills the other spouse, if they just said, nope, that's not murder anymore, mm -hmm. would it be a state issue or would the federal government step in and say, no, that's still murder? You, you don't, at the state level, don't get to decide what is and is not murder. So I think a lot of that comes down to definitions. Um, and like you said, you know, to you, viability starts at 21 or 23 weeks, whatever the medical community has come up to. Um, for me, life begins at conception. Mm -hmm. 
because in any other circumstance, you can relate any stage of the baby's or fetus's development to somebody outside of the womb. For example, a baby um, can't breathe on their own. Well, neither can somebody in an iron lung. Right. Does that change who they are or what they are classified as? No. Uh, baby, but, baby may not have independent thought or consciousness. Right. Neither does somebody necessarily in a coma. Right. And so in those situations, those analogous situations, mm. should the parents be the ones to decide whether or not to leave the person on the child, that actual born baby on life support, or should it be the government stepping in to say, no, you have to. You, like, should the state government be able to tell parents of a, of, a, of a baby that was born and, you know, needs three open heart surgeries mm -hmm. in order just to make it, you know, a couple more months. Mm -hmm. And even then, it's never going to see its first birthday. Can the parents have the option to say, no, we, you know, we don't want to go forward with these surgeries? Or does the state step in and tell the parents, nope, you have to. And, you know, because that's a living baby. And you as the parents, you've got, you have to do it, mm -hmm. no matter what the consequences are to you. You got to take on the financial burden. You have to live with the mental anguish of witnessing, you know, your, your brand new baby go through these excruciating surgeries mm -hmm. for no actual longevity to the life of any real normalcy. It, mm -hmm. It's still not going to survive. Can the state step in there? Or can the state only step in before the baby is born to say, now you still have to proceed. Once it's born, it's up to you as the parents. That's actually a good question. Um, because now who do you decide when the state should step in or if the state should step in? Do you leave that up to the federal government to decide when that happens? Or should you move that down to maybe the state level? Maybe we as Michiganders all decide, you know, maybe the state should step in at X point. But everybody from Idaho, nope, we don't want the state to step in at all. Why not let a community choose at that point? Because I don't think it's a role for government. I don't think that's the proper role for government to intervene in that horrific scenario where parents have just given birth to a, a child that mm -hmm. is not going to survive. And, you know, there's a surgeon saying, you know, we can try these experimental procedures. And it should be, I want to I want to place my trust in the parents mm -hmm. to do whatever they feel is best. I'm not even going to say what is the best option there because I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I don't, there's no way for the government to know what is best in that situation. True. So uh, for me as the voter, I don't want to pretend like, yeah, I'll just give the government authority to make the decision. Mm -hmm. That's not my place. They're already in horrible situations it doesn't benefit me as somebody not involved mm -hmm. to think okay well at least the government is interfering to make sure that my 30,000 foot level analysis of it is you know playing out the way that I yeah. in theory want it it gets so personal and so nuanced the government shouldn't be involved in it, it when it comes down to a medical necessity or quality of life Something like that, I can agree with. A hundred percent, I can agree with you. Uh, I wouldn't want a child that's going to suffer all day in a hospital. Okay. Um, I, I think that's more empathy. But when I'm when I talk about abortion, I speak as abortion as a whole and not yeah. as just a, a portion, like right. the medical necessity part. Right. Um, I I lent, sent you that link on your Facebook post. I don't know if you had a chance to read. It. I, I did not yet. Okay. But yeah. Um, it was talking about the majority out of those that took part of that survey, which I think it was about fourteen hundred people, roughly. Um, it was for anybody watching. It was from the National Institute of Health, the NIH. Yeah. Um, and it found that over seventy three percent, I believe, of those that chose to have an abortion wasn't medical necessity right it was i didn't have the money i wanted to continue schooling um i just wasn't ready for it it was a surprise mm -hmm. um surprisingly to me only one percent was from coercion from a partner i would have figured that would have been a little higher mm -hmm. um so to me that's not what you're describing as far as the right. need for to me 
that's somebody not taking accountability and using it as a form of contraceptive. That to me, I can't accept. And I totally understand that side. Now, I'm of the mindset that it's not my place to tell those women who, you know, it's a surprise, they weren't, and it, it is so disruptive to their lives that mm -hmm. my judgment of it should not in any way be codified into law. Mm -hmm. it, and now we started this conversation out, I tried to explain the guardrails for my position mm -hmm. you know, in a Roe v. Wade world and to go to the extreme because the other side of it, if we don't have Roe v. Wade, if it is the that now every state gets to decide, mm -hmm. how can you possibly construct the law in a way that does not result in those women who you believe should be able to access abortion due to the medical necessity situations? Mm -hmm. How do you construct a law in a way that still allows for that, but you know then prevents the abortions that you personally disagree with? So there was, um, and I can't remember which state uh, hand that has it, uh, that recently banned abortions but made a medical exception in the event of rape, incest, and medical necessity. So just listing, yeah, I wouldn't know the exact word, but right. legally, uh, for it, but you would literally just put an exception in there for a uh, if the lady was if the woman was raped, if the woman uh, suffered incest, if there's a medical necessity for the baby's life, the mother's life, or a general quality of service, and that's where you would pull back to the medical experts. How would you define a quality of life? You know, obviously sitting in a hospital suffering in pain all day. Well, that's not a very good quality of life. Um, would they be viable outside? Well, there have been people that have been told they'd never walk again that are still walking. Mm -hmm. Medical experts aren't always right. Right, no, and yes, and that's why any time you try to make those exceptions into a law, mm -hmm. you're creating a situation where, okay, you know, one doctor views, okay, these test results as this child is not viable. You know, they think they there's a good chance of a trisomy 13 birth defect. And mm -hmm. and so now there's not immediate danger to the health of the mother, but it's very likely that this fetus will not you know, survive. And even if it does make it full term, it's not going to make it out of the hospital. That is a medical opinion. Mm -hmm. Now, another doctor could in theory look at similar results and think that okay the odds of it are a little bit lower you know there's still a 20 percent chance that no everything's going to be fine you know just the number of ultrasounds where they miss you know diagnose if mm -hmm. it's male or female like that happens oh yes and so now is it simply that you think the law should say as long as there's a doctor saying that there's a risk to the mother of a certain percentage that therefore then that qualifies, or is it that you know there needs to be unanimous agreement? That I think is where the medical exception, mm -hmm. again, to try to codify it into law, it's it's the government using too vague to figure out the nuance that is what women actually face. I, I can see that potentially being an issue, yes, you know, you're, you, do you follow just a single doctor? Do you maybe do a two out of three kind of thing? Um, I, I guess it, when it comes to that, uh, I, again, we're not gonna get things right the first time. We never have, mm -hmm. never will. Um, and at least if we have something at a state level, I think it's a lot easier to change versus something at a federal level. Um, and is it perfect? No, not by any means. Will there be people that slip through? Absolutely, it's gonna happen. Um, and I think that's gonna be with any facet of life though. But it, it, there's also an element we haven't brought up yet, which is the father's role. Mm -hmm. uh, what does the father get to say? If the mother's like, I don't want this baby, we'll say we kept Roe v. Wade. Yeah. Um, and it qualifies, and she qualifies to have an abortion. Does yeah. the father get a say in it? In my opinion, no. Now, okay. I do think, though, because of that 
because it is the woman's body and mm -hmm. you have to give deference to that bodily autonomy and her rights to mm -hmm. control her own body. I, I, in exchange for her getting to control, have total control over the decision, I think the father should unfortunately have the option to basically abort his responsibilities as a father mm -hmm. of severing the financial responsibilities you know okay. to do so during the pregnancy period where if she's in theory able to make a decision all on her own to not have the child mm -hmm. he should also then have some freedom of his own as to whether or not he can choose to not be responsible for it okay. um, you know after a certain point you know yeah. where it's viable he loses that option you know if she's lost her option that's yeah, yeah. just for equity sake there because yes there is a different dynamic between the father and the mother mm -hmm. she should always be given the the default deference in controlling her body mm -hmm. um but he should not be wholly at the whim of her decision if if she can choose something that he doesn't like then he should be able to choose something that she may not like mm -hmm. that's and I would be okay with the inverse of that as well. Uh, for example, if you know abortion was outright banned, that he be responsible to help her oh. at, at that point, whether it be some financial assistance, prenatal care, um, taking her to the doctor appointment, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I'd be completely okay with that as well, with that being required of him. Well, absolutely. So, yes, if if the state is stepping in to tell the, to take away the woman's bodily autonomy, and yeah, it's the least the state can do to take away his autonomy, financial autonomy. Yes. Um, and just, you know, obligations to. But I still, though, am not in favor of seeing the state do that at all. Mm -hmm. um, because of, you can say things are going to slip through the cracks, but it's like our criminal justice system where it's better to let a guilty person walk free than to put an innocent person behind bars. And there is no regulating of abortion that isn't going to result in even those women that you think, you know, if you were in their shoes, you would realize, okay, yeah, she should be able to have it. The, if you give power to the state to try to, you know, make a law that applies across the board, it's going to result in these innocent women, even in your own eyes, innocent. Now, I view, even those that, yeah, it's just inconvenient for them or whatever their decision is, I fully respect it. You know, prior to viability, I, it is, and even after viability, I, I, can, I can empathize with all of the things that go on with a woman going through pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And it is something where I just, I don't want to say what's right or wrong for them. And because I don't want to say what's right or wrong for them, I don't want the state acting on my behalf to tell them what's right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Like they should be able to do that because it is, they're the, you talk about local control, it doesn't get more local than the woman herself. I mean, yeah. you know, the federal you are opposed to, so you wanna bring it a little bit more local to the state, bring it all the way local to the person and. But if you're gonna take it local to the person, then you gotta take it local to the baby. Humans have one heart, mm -hmm. one brain, mm -hmm. 10 fingers with exceptions, mm -hmm. you know, we don't have 20 fingers, we don't have two hearts, we don't have two stomachs. You know, a lot of that's there prior um, to the 21 week viability. Okay, so then if you're trying to get into personhood, this becomes then clearly a 14th Amendment issue where the whole idea of the 14th Amendment, if you're a person in one state Mm -hmm. You're a person in every state. That mm -hmm. is the Fourteenth Amendment, and so if it's going to be that, you know, when you have a, a zygote or you know at conception, and mm -hmm. if that then becomes a person with rights, you you don't have any rights until you're a person. Right. But once you're a person with rights, you have those rights across the country according to the Fourteenth Amendment. Okay. And so, to say that, yeah, in this state, it's. You know the the baby at that point is a person and you know has the right to to continue mm -hmm. you know in the womb that has to then be applied to other states it, it, because i mean we 
fought a civil war over it yes. in many ways. Yes. Um, and so that's why eliminating Roe v. Wade was the only logical real approach. And yes, it results in an outcome that many people disagree with what others are deciding, but it's, it's about them deciding for their situation. Mm -hmm. It's not about you. And yeah, you know, I see people do things that I may disagree with, but it's freedom. Mm -hmm. and, and until it affects me, <coughs> my opinion really should not matter at all on what their behavior is. I can agree that at that point, yes, you know, with the 14th Amendment, it would have to be a federal level. And I think that's what the justices were trying to do. They were trying to correct a mistake that they made. Basically, they created a law, and that's not their job. They're putting it back to the states because that's really the only way to do that, short of Congress going through and saying, hey, here's a brand new 26th Amendment or whatever uh, regarding abortion. And then at that point, it would say federal law. Um, and I think that's what really they're trying to push, more or less. Um, even Ruth Bader Ginsburg said that it would never hold. You know, she was against that. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the justices, since it was put in, all thought it was a mistake. Because again, it was the Supreme Court overstepping their bounds, and it should have never happened in the first place. Uh, according to them. Now, it, and getting back to whether or not morally we think abortions are right or wrong, that all comes based off of everybody's opinion, and I, I think that as a society that should be more local, and not necessarily like down to that person, but as a society, we decide what's morally acceptable, what's morally wrong. Um, and I think that's where it has to come down to. Now, when it comes to any other aspects of bodily autonomy, though, do you still hold that view that it should be locally decided? On uh, like, because that is the crux of the issue: is bodily autonomy for these mm -hmm. you know, pregnant women? Do they control their body, or have they lost that ability to control what happens to their 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 body? And it's now the government deciding. I've actually had this discussion with a buddy of mine who's a whole hardly believer of bodily autonomy. Mm -hmm. And my question that he couldn't answer to him was, at what point does that baby, how do you decide bodily autonomy? Who gets it? At what point? Is it consciousness? Is it viability? Is it conception? How do you decide when that happens? That's where I, going back to my original, is leave it to the medical community to determine at this point, the doctor is violating their Hippocratic Oath if mm -hmm. they do the abortion. If the medical community decides that, yes, that is its own independent, viable person that... But you're going back to viability. Well, it, not, it, not necessarily autonomy. Okay, because even... You can have an autonomy with the baby that's born and needs all those surgeries. Mm -hmm. That's an autonomous child, mm -hmm. but you're still leaving it up to the parents. At least I hope you would still recognize it should be up to the parents to decide whether or not the surgeries occur and all of those mm -hmm. things. So even when there's bodily autonomy for the, the baby or the fetus, you can still recognize that doesn't take away the parental rights to determine, con to continue with life support which is yeah. what pregnancy is in a way, is continuing life, form support. Of life support. Yeah. Okay, I could, I could agree that's a form of life support essentially. But then in that, in that case, when does the parental rights end? For example, if, if my daughter gets into a car accident mm -hmm. and is now on life support yeah. or something, and yeah. she's say 32, do I have the right to terminate that? 18. I mean, like, because my two daughters, yeah, if either of them were to face a medical catastrophe, mm. it would be up to my wife and I to decide. I mean, just as, like, if my wife or I were to have something happen, you know, it, the, the system already exists to determine when an individual is incapacitated and unable to make dis medical decisions for themselves, who's the next person in line to make those decisions. Mm. And so, yes, the parents... Up until the child is 18, they're, they are the default decision makers. Correct. Once somebody's 18, you know, you get into, this is very much the Terry Schiavo case, 
where she was incapacitated and mm -hmm. her husband wanted one thing, her parents wanted the other. Was that the one down in uh, Florida? Florida? Oh, yeah, okay. back in like 2000. Yeah. And, and that was where the law was very clear. It was the husband's role. He was mm -hmm. the one who the law said, Mexican, but if you yes. Would. But the state stepped in because the parents wanted her to stay on life support. The state stepped in to basically override the law to give the parent, like to give deference to the one who wanted to keep her alive. Mm. The, and had it been reversed, the state would not have, you know, stepped in to, you know, go with the parents to take her off life support. They were right. just trying to side with life. Right. And that's why that decision back then was so, you know, newsworthy and all that is because, yeah, you, it's very clear that the husband, you know, is the legal authority there to decide whether mm -hmm. or not she remains on life support. You can disagree with his opinion, his position to take her off, but it's not for you. It's for, we have the system in place mm -hmm. for the parents to decide or for the spouse to decide. And whatever their decision is, we've got to respect that because otherwise, you know, if it's only whatever individual wants to, you know, step in and, and fight for life, mm -hmm. what you're doing to the others who just want to see their loved one pass peacefully, mm -hmm. it is it is all the more devastating to them. Like they're already in a horrible situation and it's just making it worse to see, you know, their wishes not respected mm -hmm. and, and others just step in. Right. So with that, you know, obviously the state overstepped their bounds in that case. You know, the law was already decided. They were trying to essentially usurp that law. Um, and they shouldn't be doing that. Um, it, it, I think with that case, I was actually for the husband being able to choose because, again, you know, legal precedent for that. Um, there is no real legal precedent older or prior to Roe v. Wade for abortion. You know, it wasn't as common of a thing. And I think it's even on a downward trend mm -hmm. if what I, some of the stories I was reading was correct. Yeah. Um, it's just that, I, I guess, going back to like the, the bodily autonomy, for having the medical community decide on that, um, you know, for science, we don't follow necessarily the medical community, but like, a bioorganism is considered life on Mars, mm -hmm. but somehow a clump of cells that we know is a life, zygote or whatever you want to call it, is not considered a life on Earth. And to me, that just that plays this weird conundrum of, well, what is life then? How do you define a life? I, because I mean, I don't think my position would say that that's not life. I, I respect that it is life, mm -hmm. but I also respect when an individual's bodily autonomy rights supersede the rights of a non-person. I, I don't give personhood to a fertilized egg, an embryo, a zygote, or even a fetus. Mm -hmm. You know, prior to viability, there's there's really, it shouldn't have any rights in my opinion, because it is still a, within the body of another person who does have full bodily autonomy and rights, and they shouldn't come secondary to to, yeah, a fetus inside of her. Mm. And I think that's where fundamentally we're gonna we're not gonna agree yeah. on things, which yeah. is fine. Yes. Um, and I think that's really where the core of the debate comes down to is how do you decide that separation of autonomy and, and personhood, if you will, as you said. Um, for me, I, I just I don't know. I, I can't see short of a medical necessity, rape, incest, all that stuff. I can't see allowing the intentional withdrawal of what we know as life. Only because, because you've mentioned now a couple times, for an exception for rape, mm -hmm. that opens up a whole different can of worms as far as how does the law, do you have to get a conviction? Mm -hmm. Does the woman simply have to claim that she was raped? Like, what is the, because, you know, if it's gotta be that there's gotta be a convicted rape in order for her to be able to access an abortion, that clearly mm -hmm. you're on a time crunch and that's not going to allow for due process for the accused. Right. And so just that exception alone, which absolutely, you know, women who are impregnated through rape, it's only all the more horrible if mm -hmm. the government 
forces them to proceed with it. That's but, why I said you got to make an exception for that. I don't but, believe it. But is. how does that exception work? That that is not an actual exception that could ever work. But it currently does. There's already exceptions in almost every state, and I, I don't know about in Roe v. Wade uh, as far as if there's exception for that. It wasn't necessary under Roe v. Wade. But I mean, you're talking about less than one percent of all current abortions being due to rape and incest. But if it's simply that you outlaw abortion mm -hmm. unless the woman was raped. Doesn't that incentivize women saying they were raped in order to access that abortion? Then at that point, I think you have to treat it just like you would if it was like an actual rape case. I think there needs to be uh, a required investigation. Um, obviously, you can't rush it like you said. That would uh, violate the other rights. There wouldn't be enough time for due process. Um, I think at that point, you would have to penalize the woman. Uh, if she, if she was to lie about it, uh, in that case, so say my daughter said that she was raped. Okay, we go through the process of the investigation, and everything. Uh, if it came through the investigation that she was lying just so that she could have an abortion, then yes, I think there should be a penalty for that. It would be the same thing as filing a false police report to try to get somebody in jail. Um, the numerous false rape accusations that fall against some guys uh, that never did anything, but their life is now ruined because socially rape is so bad that, you know, we're gonna come after you because you're being accused of it. Yeah. No proof or nothing. Yeah. I think there needs to be a penalty for that kind of thing. So falsely try to do that. And I think if, as long as there's a penalty to it, you would de-incentivize the use of rape or incest. Incest obviously being a little harder, I think, to try to prove and everything. Um, but again, I think if there's a penalty strong enough, not just a slap on the wrist, I think if there's a penalty strong enough, you would de-incentivize people from using that as an excuse to try to get it because abortion is out, uh, out, out, outright banned. Yeah. Okay. And so, I mean, you know, I think we can wrap it up, do you think? Because mm -hmm. I... I found this to be a good conversation that yeah it's not what's out there right now the the you go on social media or you just you know you watch the normal news media mm -hmm. and you have the sides putting out statements talking past each other to just try to talk to the audience yep. and there's no engagement yes all I want to do with my campaign is try to foster a sense of okay we can engage like i hope you didn't find this to be a bad thing at no all that no I'm, I'm rethinking some of the things that you would talk about even i mean the whole viability and the bodily autonomy like i said I've, I've talked to my buddy about that before and a lot of it makes sense um i it, the hardest part for me is when to separate it so yeah and that's more of a personal struggle that I think I'd have to go through and look through, so. And that's where, so, because I can make it, a, you know, 100% honest with you what my views are, mm -hmm. and still, you know, if you vote for me, that's great, you know, I that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. If you don't, I totally respect that, because yeah, my positions do not align with yours, and so, but regardless of how you're gonna vote, I still just wanna be able to talk to you, yeah. and be able to have these conversations, because that's what, lowers the temperature a little bit yes because i think the path that we're on is leading to a dark place and uh, i think we're already in that dark place right. to be honest yes and for me the only way i can see you know my actions helping to get us out is to do this engagement mm -hmm. just because yeah i i don't view you as some evil person who's out there trying to you know be an author authoritarian you know theocratic you know controller of women like you know, the, mm -hmm. I, I can disagree with the policies that you're advocating for while still respecting your humanity and your your opinions coming, you know, you we're very much able to explain them very well. And, and so just being able to hear those explanations from either side makes it where we don't hate each other so much, we just disagree. Yes. And disagreement is fine. And yes, on an issue like this, there's a lot of people that they don't want to think that disagreement is fine. And 
I understand why, because yes, life is involved. It is literally life and death, yes. you know, in a lot of ways. And so it is one of the most polarizing issues. And I mean, for two guys to discuss it, yeah, it's not as consequential to us. So it is mm -hmm. easier for us to, you know, think like, okay, somebody who disagrees with my opinion, I can still see the There's humanity in emotion because time. yeah, you're not trying to control my body. Yeah. So it's it's I don't have that hurdle to get over to yeah. see your humanity. Um and so I, I respect those on both sides that they just think, okay, you know, what they're doing being pro choice, it's killing babies. I understand that view. The other side of, you know, you're controlling women's bodies, yeah, I understand that view. If that's all the discussion is, though, we just further polarize, further isolate into our bubbles and just continue to create an environment where we can't coexist. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I'm hoping to just be an example of showing how we can, we mm -hmm. can have these conversations. So I really thank you for yeah. coming today and well thank you for having me and thanks for the conversation it's like i said not often you get to see somebody in your local community that you can actually reach out to and say hey let's just talk yeah so yeah let me know when you're ready for the gun debate okay yeah i mean i'm i'm more than happy to um and i mean because yeah you clearly are you're coming at it and you're saying things that i've not heard before i've tried to have discussions like this you, you raise points that I had not actually heard mm. somebody else raise. And that, I think, moves the conversation forward and creates better understanding. So definitely, your views, I, I'm interested in hearing more of. And so, yeah, yeah. we can do it again. Absolutely. We're more than happy to. Well, thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes.